Hi, my name is Kirshad Araz. Uh, I am the CTO and a co-founder for Corellia Biosystems. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the next generation protein assays and how these assays enable precision medicine and data-driven biology. Uh, to serve the uh, broad audience, um, I categorized my uh, presentation into different sections that will be easy to navigate. So we'll start with proteomics in the age of omics. Uh, let's start with like what proteins are. Uh, proteins are large complex molecules that play many critical roles in biological organisms. Uh, they serve essential functions in all biological entities from 50 nanometer sized viruses to 100 feet long mammals like a blue whale. Um, they are made of, of long chains of different combinations of 20 different amino acids, in, in, especially in case of humans. And, and after this like long chain falls into itself, that specific shape and mechanical properties matters. So we'll discuss more about that. So proteins take care of the essential functions in a biological entity. So biological entity is a complex organism. It involves a lot of functions from cellular to organism level. And all of these functions are taken care of by different types of proteins. So let's look at the defense function. So antibodies, immunoglobulins, bind specific foreign objects to help protect the body. Enzymes, all of the enzymes are proteins, carry out almost all of the thousands of chemical reactions that take place in cells, including reading the genetic information stored in DNA or synthesize different molecules to serve different functions. Uh, a lot of proteins act as uh, messengers. They transmit signals to coordinate biological processes. Uh, this can be from cell to cell or cell to tissue or, or organ to organ. Uh, one example is, for example, growth hormone, or like most of the hormones are in this category, and also cytokines are also in this category. They also provide structural support uh, for cells and on larger scale as well. They allow the body to move. So if you if you kind of intend to move your arm, what happens actually is zillions of actual proteins are moving on top of each other, collectively contributing that macroscopic uh, movement of of your of your body part. Uh, they also take place uh, in, uh, take role in transport and storage, uh, bind and carry atoms and small molecules within cells throughout the body. For example, ferritin in this case helps uh, with, the, with the iron metabolism. It, it kind of it captures and releases iron, depending on the case. Simil similarly, hemoglobin, for example, carries oxygen from lungs to, to the tissue. So protein data is critical and complements the genetic, genetic sequencing data. Over the last 20 years, thanks to the revolution in sequencing technologies, um, like uh, sequencing time uh, and cost dropped significantly. That created a huge amount of like information wealth uh, in the genomic space. Uh, and if you kind of like compare the complexity, like definitely that wealth of information is like super valuable. Uh, uh, no one can ignore that. Uh, but when you, you look at like protein domain, uh, there are about like 20,000 genes in the human body, and they provide a roadmap to health. In the protein side, protein side, it's, it is way more complex. There are about like one more than one million functional diverse proteins doing different functions. They, these proteins interact with each other, they change each other, and 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 they are the kind of what give you the picture of what's happening, what is really happening in the biological entity at that given time. So if, if the genes are giving the roadmap, we will say that like proteomic snapshot will give you the real-time traffic of what's happening. So let's look at a specific case of like cell division cycle. So this is a cycle that's highly regulated process. It involves a lot of feedback mechanisms and a lot of proteins and, and signaling um, molecules play in this, in this feedback loop. Uh, and, and it's, it's really, it's, it's part of it. It's very complex. And most of the actual functions in, in cell uh, and also like tissue level, organ level, goes through like similar pathways that actually uh, tens or hundreds of like molecules, proteins interact with each other to collectively uh, get cell to do some, some, some task. So let's look at the case of Ross protein here, for example. This Ross protein gets on and off. Uh, by the inputs coming from other surrounding proteins and or like molecules. And, and that actually triggers signal to the cell nuclei that actually, hey, it's time for like cell division, so get prepared. So if that Ross molecule, for example, protein uh, gets modified by because of a mutation or another like toxic substance gets and turns the Ross on permanent, what happens actually cells get to the crazy cycle of division. So it doesn't listen to like feedback mechanisms and start to like divide crazy. So unless like other other cells around me, like 
like that biological entity's defense mechanism notices that, this then turns into a tumor, basically. So there are so many proteins involving in this in this like uh, simplified uh, process, and they take care of like so many different essential functions. But also this means that so many ways things may go wrong. So from the disease perspective, uh, most diseases uh, are actually viewed and targeted from a proteomic perspective as a result of a functional change of the protein. So proteins are working like K key uh, lock uh, combination like. So for example, assume that uh, your key loses one of the toot and, and it no longer like opens the lock. So similarly, a functional change of the protein, it results a change shape, a change in the shape that results that protein may not be able to perform its function. Uh, so basically that's a, that's a disease uh, or, or a disorder or up or down regulation of a protein. So proteins at the end, even like they do individually, their, their impact is in a collective behavior. So in that sense, uh, their concentration needs to be in a kind of like certain range. If it is below or above that certain range, then that's kind of like a disease or disorder state as well. Uh, similarly, like in the case of an infection, what, what you have in an infection is another object enters the body and, and triggers other functional things in his interest, uh, which involves intruder proteins and intruder functions, basically. So in that sense, you can view infection as a way of like, you know, from a proteomic domain as well. So if you look in that way, the therapy is also coming in that perspective. So most therapeutic applications aim either to, like in that perspective, inhibit or proliferate a protein function, like i.e. control it, or reinstate a lacking but essential protein function. Uh, and if either of these is not possible, like literally the therapy is to supply the end product uh, that couldn't be produced by the problematic protein, protein function. Like in case of, for example, insulin in diabetes, uh, you have to monitor it outside the body like by measuring the glucose level and then, and then administer actually uh, hormones uh, through a therapy such that actually you can uh, regulate the blood sugar levels. So if you look at the top selling 20 drugs, these are 2018 numbers. Uh, the, uh, so I kind of categorized the mechanism of action in the table. So what you see here, all of these proteins, sorry, all of these drugs, excuse me, all of these drugs, they are targeting a protein. So first of all, they're all of them, they're targeting protein. In addition to that, like 11 of them uh, are also proteins themselves. They're like antibodies or or, or, or proteins uh, or fusion proteins, they are aiming to fix, bind, do something to some other protein in the in the biological entity. Historically speaking, antibiotics, painkillers, they were like blockbuster drugs of the previous decades, and and they're the same. They also they were also, they were also mostly targeting uh, proteins directly. So how does the future look? So we are hearing actually a lot of like promising technologies that will especially uh, target uh, genetic disorders or, or mutations and, and uh, like through gene therapy, through viral vectors or gene editing, targeted gene editing through CRISPR or other technologies coming up. I'm sure like more interesting stuff will be coming, we will be hearing. So although these approaches will target the DNA directly, the efficacy and checkpoint assessments are still proteomic. So don't forget that this therapy is still aimed to modify a proteomic function or fix it via modifying DNA. So, so in that sense, uh, importance of proteins or like targeting protein as perspective is, is not changing at all. So two major conclusions of this section. So the need for actionable data that reflects the actual state of the biology entity is increasing, it's not decreasing. And the proteins in that uh, scheme will be increasing the part of the story in understanding disease state and therapy development efforts. So we are changing gears to section two. So protein testing and immunosays. So ways to test proteins, in, I, in this case, like what, what I mean by the test is like presence and concentration. So chromatography, mass spectroscopy, Western blotting and cell-based assays are highly utilized in discovery and early research phases. So they shed a lot of light uh, in early stages. But in later stages, once you identify your target, once you know like what proteins you're dealing with, uh, immunosays are a lot more straightforward. They are like well characterized beforehand. So you just like buy a kit or like review your in-house ELISA and then you do that repeatedly for your experiment. So in that regard, in all of the later stages, immunosays are the workhorse for like testing proteins. And although we are discussing mostly around like pharma, it's, uh, it's also look 
just outside the window that what's uh, out there, outside the pharma, uh, the, even SAs are the workhorse technology for measuring biomarkers ubiquitously. So in that sense, uh, the, their applications cover not only pharma R&D, but also like health monitoring, infectious disease monitoring, environmental monitoring, agriculture and food safety, and also animal health. So all of these areas are served by the general immunosay market, which is totaling about uh, a $17 billion market, which is growing every year, uh, three to 5%. So getting back to the pharma, uh, so immunosay's use cases in pharma, in many cases, monitoring protein levels and function help with, first of all, diagnosing the problem, right? So before you kind of like develop a solution, you need to understand what is the problem. Uh, you need to understand the problem well enough such that actually you can then start thinking, developing, and then implementing therapies. So in that sense, definitely diagnosis is one way. In that case, actually protein uh, immunoassays are highly utilized. Uh, developing therapies, like when you're developing the therapy, putting in the work in the, in the lab, uh, most of the actual assays involve immunoassays. Checking therapy safety, toxicity, and side effects, like what kind of like... Uh, other like alarming molecules, cytokines are released when you administer that drug to your cells, to small animal or later stages in humans, for example, what kind of toxicities you observe. All these assays are also uh, following different protein levels that indicate actually a different toxic behavior or response from the biological entity. Uh, similarly, monitoring the therapy efficacy, like some, some therapies needs to be kind of like tuned for the individual patient. In that sense, you need to kind of measure something and then administer the drug accordingly and sometimes stop the therapy. So in that sense, you have a like feedback loop where the proteomic domain is providing you the data, actionable data. Similarly, monitoring immunity, past infection, immunity through vaccination, all these areas are served by immunosay. So this kind of like, uh, this, is, this is fresh. I want to kind of like pull the audience to think about actually what's going on with like COVID-19 case. I hope things will over soon, but like uh, there's definitely more work for all of us, including us uh, to do. And in many cases, monitoring protein levels and function are kind of like relevant to like how we fight uh, with COVID-19, like diagnosing the problem, you know, like how, how have we diagnosed? Yes, PCR tests are really wonderful to kind of like give you acute, uh, acute understanding of the, of the disease, but like past infections or like herd immunity, when you're kind of looking to other things, you kind of like involve immunosis or diagnosing the problem, understanding what kind of proteins are involved in this in this path when when this virus is kind of like working in the body uh, what kind of like receptors it's using what kind of like uh, antibodies or like what kind of like uh, proteins it's 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 synthesizing and using understanding all this mechanism how it gets internalized to the cell what kind of like response body gives to this disease understanding all these requires you tremendous amount of testing and these are all immunosays. And then developing therapies. So there are like, I'm seeing two approaches in COVID right now. One is like developing therapies as antivirals, actually to, to inhibit the, the reverse transcriptase enzyme uh, in, 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 in the cells. Uh, and like, how can you like slow down specific to the viral case? And like that will kind of like inhibit the viral replication. And there are also like other therapies for, especially for patients who are, who's, so like in, in cases actually their body giving some um, some 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 response inflammatory response that actually uh, giving damage to the body. So in that case you're trying to monitor different cytokine levels and control them such that actually to control the inflammation. So in that sense, like it's 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 widely used. We are seeing a lot of papers actually published around different uh, levels of cytokines, how they play into 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 this disease, and how kind of what kind of treatments can be can be done. Uh, checking therapy safety, toxicity, and side effects. There are a lot of drugs being available. Uh, uh, researchers are trying to put them into trial, clinical trials, to see actually if these drugs are, are making the case better while not kind of like harming the harming the patient, you know, like checking the trap safety or like monitoring the trap efficacy, or later on like monitoring the immunity, past infection, for example. So like, can you? Uh, that is a big question right now, right? Can we have like vastly available immunoassays that will kind of like give us information about like past infection and immunity such that actually we can like open up the um, uh, workforce. So in short, uh, this is very relevant. Immunoassays are really central to what's going on in this case. 
and we'll be seeing actually more discussions going around the actual immunosays, their shortcomings and advantages uh, in the next coming years, I, I believe. So getting some technical details. Uh, so ELISA is one way of like immunosays. That's the most common uh, available one. That's, I would say, in the immunosay uh, segment. And uh, the basic principle is like same in most immunosays, only the substrate and simple assay protocols uh, change. So in that sense, this is what we will be showing here is applicable to other immunosay parts as well. So, so the goal here is that you have a biological sample coming from like human sample or mouse study, or it could be a cell study. And you have a target protein X that you're trying to identify and the concentration is unknown and you're trying to get to data. So what you do is like you take an ELISA plate, you incubate your samples, your target protein gets captured, then after a couple of washes, you put the probing antibodies, that signal is correlated to the concentration of that unknown to risk and that curve. So this is a kind of highly uh, laborsome uh, protocol. So you, it has like in 10 user steps, use a 10 micro, 100 microliters of sample. Typically it takes four to eight hours. We do a lot of, for example, ELISA, plate-based ELISA in our company to compare our benchmark, our, uh, our, uh, our, our microliter based technology against. And definitely like typical time is like six to eight hours. It is uh, plus the data analysis and everything like preparation. It's, it's, it's a complex, I would say it takes sometimes like one to half, one and a half days when we talk to customers, that's the, what uh, they say to us. So plus it's a 50 year old technology. So if you kind of like look at the, like how this technology developed and evolved till today, uh, it looks quite interesting. So I want to touch base with that as well. So, so in this history, the first MSA recorded uh, was from the 1950s, Yellow and Berson um, first actually published a paper. They demonstrated actually MSA, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, insulin level assay. It was an insulin level measurement assay. And, and that was such an impactful study that actually, and it opened a breakthrough. So you're, you have a sample and then you have a molecule you're trying to measure and you have you, you actually demonstrate a way to measure that entity. Uh, that, 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 that's a quite breakthrough. And, uh, and, and, and Yellow receives the Nobel Prize in, in 1977. Uh, next, uh, next development comes around 71, uh, where Engwall and Perlman uh, demonstrate enzyme amplification and also solid phase uh, assay. So basically, this is kind of like basically they demonstrate an assay in post stratum tube. So this development in 97 is what plate based ELISAs are today. So the technology since then has seen really small changes. So another big breakthrough was in 75, Kohler and Milstein. Uh, they actually developed the hybridoma technology, which enabled to manufacture uh, specific monoclonal antibodies. So before, like the only way you can run an assay was use some polyclonal antibodies that you filter from the like animal sources. That was a like super low and inefficient process. So with this process actually, this process amplified the uh, usage of uh, immune assays and that led to a Nobel Prize. Um, of course, like this technology has also other impacts in other fields of biology as well. And then in 76, like should have demonstrated the chemical luminescence. And since then, like the technology is still same. So that robust technology still serves thousands of biologists around the world from big pharma to small pharma. So we, in 2000s, we see uh, adoption of novel facility technologies uh, with the increasing need of multiplexing, I would say. Bit as they say in microarrays, uh, enable end users to generate multiplexed uh, data from a single sample. Uh, uh, volume uh, set uh, and digital immunosays and microfluidic approaches also start to emerge. Uh, so why this thing is so powerful and has been there for 50 years with with not much of a change? First of all, uh, it's a quite robust and powerful method. It yields quantitative, relevant, and actionable data. Uh, most often, plate-based analysis in particular doesn't require advanced technology. You have the plates, you have your biomarkers, you can homebrew your ELISA in-house. The only thing you need is a plate reader and just standard uh, pipettes. So, and, and compared to many other assays like involving cells or other different kind of like uh, assays where you have like more complexity involved, they are quite robust. So in that regard, uh, that's one reason they are the workforce, uh, workhorse to generate like uh, data over the last 56, 70 years. But things are changing. So especially in the last uh, five uh, years, we are seeing actually new type of approaches 
pushing the limits, like precision medicine or cell therapies, or increasing need with the like point of care applications, or pharma's view of like data-driven biology. You know, all these things are pushing uh, the limits of like current enabling technologies. So in that sense, better ELISA technologies that are more easily uh, generating data will be needed in, for emerging applications, like screening drugs for target specific specific tumors. Uh, we have customers, for example, interested on this application, or quality control for gene and cell therapy, or development of like biologics for cancer applications, or ubiquitous diagnostics for infectious disease and pandemics, like the pandemic we are facing right now. So what we are starting to realizing I can say that over the last uh, two, three weeks, I read a lot of actually articles in, in 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 mass media about actually people are questioning like why are like testing infrastructure or technology and also immunosays included are, are kind of like the, the state, you know? Uh, and, and these are right questions to ask and, and also right questions to follow up. Uh, like definitely we are seeing that protein data is lagging behind because tools are slow, labor intensive and require too much sample. So this is a 50 year old technology you have been still relying on. So many application areas reveal unmet needs in terms of uh, like, for example, when you're kind of like talking to uh, pharma customers from startups to big pharma, uh, what their this new applications demand, definitely more data points per given volume and per given time. That is like repeatedly coming around. Uh, sample volume reduction. So people are trying to uh, get more data from like small volume samples, sometimes because like samples are like really, really precious. You have like just a few micrometers of sample. You want to generally maximize the data output. Uh, and people are really kind of favoring simple to set up and operate essays, versatile platforms that they fit to the like kind of like mainstream flow of their lab work. So they're not really interested like, okay, this gives a solution, but you need to kind of like, to run that essay in that platform, you need to do a lot of different things from different directions to get that essay. So that really is not the ideal case. So most of the biologists are not engineers at the end. So increased dynamic range, this is also like coming repeatedly, especially related to the clinical tires and preclinical when you dose a biological entity and when you essay, uh, you need to guess what range your essay will be. So, and if your guess is wrong, you need to repeat that diluting further or less. Increasing sensitivity is a whole grail. I think this will be here for <laughs> 50 years later as well. So uh, there is no like uh, down limit. So uh, like lower is better always. And speed for validating assays for new targets. So ELISAs are now being treated that like uh, a little slow in terms of uh, validating new targets. So these are obvious to everybody, but what are the bottlenecks? Why people cannot come up with solutions to enable or like transform this technology to the next generation? So I would say like most of the challenges in the field of immunosays can be categorized into like two sections. One is reagent, reagent related and one is the technology related. So I want to cover first the reagent related part. So in the in reagent, reagent related part, so antibody related limitations, first of all. So like if you want to run an ELISA, sandwich ELISA, you need to have it, like two pairs of like antibodies working well with that target. So antibody development process is a slow one. Like even like you use hybridoma technology, it takes like weeks, definitely six weeks to a couple of months. Uh, and it's a highly experimental process. Like after you do it, you screen and then you screen and you screen and then finally you get like few of them like working well enough. Uh, but this thing, this risk is mitigated. I would say this was a big risk 50 years ago. Right now, there are like zillions of like antibody companies. Uh, production qualities are quite well. Uh, antibodies are used as therapeutics now, so that also like triggered more quality uh, control and increase. Uh, so in that sense, especially if you're like aiming for uh, fundamental targets or like widely. Uh, like utilized targets, this is not a big risk anymore, I would say. Uh, protein stability concerns. Some proteins are definitely hard to work it's within outside of their native environment, like membrane proteins or viral capsid proteins in, in viruses, for example. Uh, but these are specific cases need to be treated as a like, specific case. And usually solutions exist that utilizing different buffers or detergents. So the major focus that I'll be focusing on the next few slides is the biophysical limitations. So let's dive into biophysics of sample incubation step in ELISA. So on the right, uh, on the left, what you see is the ELISA protocol, and we are focusing on to that incubation step, which takes typically two hours to an overnight, where you put your sample into an ELISA plate, 
where the wells are decorated with capture moieties. In this case, like this, this green triangles are your capture, let's say, antigens, and their goal is to capture that specific antibodies in that sample. So first of all, uh, one thing is how good is your like antigen antibody like affinity? You know, uh, ideally you want uh, your antibody to have like affi high affinity to that against that antigen such that like it binds well, and and low K off such that actually it dissociates like not much. So this will ensure that actually the targets in the proximity of the bottom will get captured well, and then once they get captured they will not be released back to the solution that fast. So this can be achieved by selecting an antibody that has high affinity against the target. That's what usually uh, people do when they're screening antibodies. They try to find the antibody that actually has high affinity against the target. But then what kind of like gives you the slowness in this case? So, so the question is like, how about targets in the look at that are away from that close proximity? Let's say this, let's look at this antibody that's kind of like millimeter away, just swimming inside the bulk fluid. So this, uh, this antibody, this molecule needs to kind of like do a random walk, diffuse over the hours, uh, it will do a random walk and get a successful interaction with the bottom of the plate such that it will get captured. So you're looking for a like equilibrium state that may take like hours, such that actually you efficiently capture some portion of the molecules in the solution such that you can generate some meaningful signal. So this is, uh, we call it like fishing with a pole. We literally have the bait and then waiting in the ocean for that molecule or fish to come and find your bait. So although there are like new technologies like bead-based assays, microarrays, uh, they're also impacted from this short diffusion limited like transport uh, shortcoming. Because at the end, on a bead, the antibody is on the surface and uh, or, or, the, or the capture moiety, in this case, the, the antigen is on the surface, and you're trying to capture the other molecule, which is still in the order of a millimeter or like a couple of hundred microns away. So in that sense, there are still like limited, diffusion limited um, uh, procedures. That's why like if you kind of read the protocols, usually they also suggest like bit-based assays and microarrays, they also similarly suggest like long incubation periods. So now we are getting into what kind of solution we are offering. Uh, where Microfieldix meets automation to handle shortcomings. So I'll talk through a Microfieldix advancement uh, we went through. So this project started in collaboration with Novartis, and at the time uh, we were in academia with my co-founders, and and and. And Novartis had this essay that uh, was used highly in, in blood banks to confirm hepatitis C cases. Uh, so this was a strip essay that was, that was incubated in like long cuvet, that kind of like, or a tube, uh, which requires about one milliliter of sample volume after some dilutions, uh, and involves like 20 manual steps. Uh, and don't forget that like the test, the, the reagent that you're dealing with, the sample is infectious. Uh, and and it, it, it ends like six hour long essay time. So of course, like blood banks were not really super happy after like seeing other technologies and automation. So uh, so we had a project that like, how can we come up with a new method that will actually simplify this essay and increase the performance. So uh, that was in the academic settings. We actually demonstrated, I was lucky to be part of this, uh, this, this team that where we actually demonstrated that actually we can take out those uh, same regions that they are using uh, through our collaboration they generously provided and then demonstrated and say that we can run in the order of 20 minutes, use two microliter samples in a fully automatable format. So that's yield basically 10x uh, faster essay requiring 500x less volume requirements. So, uh, so that was the start point. So let's dive into the technology further. Uh, so our technology involves a microfluidic chip where you have those channels that are connected with two valves where you put your samples and things, how things go. So what's happening inside that channel is we have a hydrogel and we have the technology to pattern the hydrogel specifically. So in this case, the green dot you see are like two different proteins immobilized into the gel body and they are ready to kind of like serve the assay. So the assay is, is a standard ELISA. You have a bait molecule, the capture molecule, you have the target molecule, in this case it's an antibody and then a fluorescent detection antibody. And if you have the reagent, as you see on the right, for example, C100P antibodies are present in that patient sample, that means that they show that person's like hepatitis C positive, it gives the signal 
uh, at that location. So getting to like the basics, how our technology enables like minutes long essays, uh, let's dive into kind of like the core technology in this case. So getting back to the um, uh, ally, plate-based ELISAs, uh, so once you kind of put your sample in, you're waiting for the diffusion of this uh, proteins that are especially far away. So that's why you were kind of like, we described this in a few slides before, uh, you, that's why you incubate uh, two hours to overnight. So what we do, we take the same reagents, in this case, this uh, green triangles, and immobilize them instead Instead of a surface, we mobilize them into a gel hydrogel body. So the hydrogel is simply a mesh of liquids with nanopores, and we immobilize these uh, antigens into these nanopores with our technology, and, and then put the sample into the wells and apply an electric field, and when the sample is sieving through uh, the gel, if there are certain biomarkers that have affinity to, against that, like capture moieties, in this case, that's the green triangles, they get captured. So this capture process happens in the order of seconds. We are only limited by the transport, how fast we can transport the reagents to that location. So we are basically introducing a fishing with a net, uh, which uh, provides an efficient electrically driven assay that is carried out in three dimensions. So it's more like a pseudo, pseudo uh, homogeneous assay, I would say. So normally I had a video in the slide, but um, because of technical uh, difficulties, uh, I'm just like showing the uh, initial and end point. So what we, we see on the left is, uh, is we'll see a channel where there is the detection zone and a net zone, and we are sending a target protein through electrophoretic forces. And when that protein migrates into the channel, within 90 seconds of load time, uh, it generates the signal you see on the right. And, and the inert zone is, of course, has no single signal. The, 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 the reagent passed through that uh, zone, generating this green curve on the bottom, uh, the background signal over time. In the meantime, the signal in the, in the detection zone accumulated, and then in 90 seconds, we stop the load, and then we do a 20 seconds of electrophoretic wash uh, to remove unwound material, where you see the background signal gets to the like, baseline level, whereas the, like, significant, the, the specific signal stays there steady. So this 90-second load uh, that you missed to see uh, in this slide, is equivalent to two hours long sample incubation step in a traditional LISA. And in this case, it's completed in 90 seconds. So that's how like our technology increases the uh, capability to reduce the, the, the assay time. Uh, our capture efficiency is really, really high. Uh, so in, in some applications where we have the, like a good antibody uh, uh, which has high affinity, we see the signal really accumulate in the right end. So what you see here in a channel in A, uh, which has actually multiplexing features, there are like four different zones capturing different, uh, different um, antibodies in this case. And if you look to like see, excuse me, C100P antigen zone, uh, we see the signal is accumulated at the right edge of that capture zone. So, and, and in D, you're seeing the signal profile uh, along the channel is showing actually very high signal at the right edge. So as soon as the antibodies enter to that detection zone, they get captured before further propagating into that detection zone. So our technology, as I said in the beginning, we can do patterning in the way that we want. So we can do multiple patterns in a single, single channel that gives us uh, endless multiplexing capability. So in this case, you're seeing two hepatitis C biomarkers immobilized into a signal channel, single channel. And, and, and when you kind of like send the relevant uh, antibody first, you only see a signal in one uh, channel versus like if you see send the other one, the other channel, you see the other channel. And then finally, if you send like both antibodies, you see like both uh, locations light up, uh, suggesting that actually you can like detect two different entities uh, by two different uh, capture moieties that uh, you can multiplex. So what do it all mean for the end user? So there is a microlix breakthrough here. And, and there was a like interested end user who was looking to replace their technology. So and what we have here, uh, you have a microfluidics expert team, I would say, and, and a highly specialized microfluidics lab involving a lot of infrastructure and equipment, uh, generating this fantastic results. What does it mean? So as it is, unfortunately, it doesn't mean much. And unfortunately, one problem we are seeing in the field of microfluidics is we see a lot of publications, but we are not seeing that actually this nice publications transforming into products. And most of them actually fail in this step. So complexity is the enemy. So you need to shield the end user from complexity 
as most end users will respect that there's innovation there, there's a hardware there, there are a lot of like weekends, uh, evenings, uh, hard works, miss parties, miss family events. Actually, there's a lot of like sweat there, of course. But uh, like at the end, they take care of like, their own like important stuff. So at the end, you need to have like automation and end user simplicity to shield the end user from your complexity. In that case, you will reach to a solution where it will satisfy the end user. So end user cares about getting data and getting data, this data very quickly, easily, accurately, and using as little as sample as possible. And your microfluidics breakthrough uh, like has the automation which leads to the data that's desired by the end user. So then you kind of like uh, happy end user and happy innovator. So our workflow, uh, uh, we are really like heading to uh, simplify the end user uh, experience. So end user opens the consumable cartridge that we provide for that specific essay, and they put uh, the, end the, the, the cartridge into the robot and they put their raw samples in the robot. And, and from the essay menu, like they select their specific essay and run the essay that takes probably three minutes hands on time. And then after a short break, uh, they enjoy your da 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 their data. Our platform provides scientists orders of magnetism or data resolving power to quantify biomarkers in small samples by using 100 times less sample volume uh, and then providing data that's like 10 times faster. So that yields combined, our platform can generate 1,000 times more data uh, compared to existing platforms um, per giving time and sample volume. So. We introduce the technology and what kind of new application areas does this technology enable? So we broadly address the need for more granular uh, data in terms of spatial and temporal resolution uh, for biomarkers. So rather than generating actual data from a lot of samples and like small number of samples, we are kind of like pushing to miniaturization in terms of like both the sample volume uh, and increase the resolution granularity there uh, spatially and and generate data so fast that actually you also get temporary resolution. We have customers we are talking that they usually do endpoint measurements, uh, not because they want to or like th that's enough for them, because actually they cannot do really in between uh, essays and get actionable data and then probe their essays. So that that doesn't exist. When we talk to the customers, they say, uh huh, like we can do, uh, we can actually do. Rather than like waiting the endpoint of the essay, I can just like probe my system a lot earlier and 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 actually like make changes on the go or increase the efficiency or yield of my like other essay, the real essay they are kind of like running behind. So so far, like we are working um, in this context, uh, five of the, the global top ten uh, pharma companies uh, and plus a few other CROs, and we have like multiple projects uh, we are working on. Some of them were completed successfully. Um, so I will just like walk through a few uh, case studies how our technology is helping uh, these customers solve their unmet needs. So example application one uh, is the single animal longitudinal studies. In this case, uh, the, the issue is like preclinical PKSAs in mice or other animals with precious, precious samples. And the problem is mice have limited blood volume and terminal assays, which are leading to death of the mouse to get the blood that's needed, uh, increase variability of data. And the solution we offer is one microliter serum assays for therapeutic proteins via tail vein bleed, uh, where the, the end user increases their data quality, reduce the cost, and happily the mouse continues to live, live uh, a little longer. So in this case study, when you kind of compare the traditional ELISA versus Corellia's ELISA, uh, the traditional ELISA requires 100 microliters of sample versus Corellia requires one microliter. The variability in ELISA is really high because you're getting uh, different data from different mice or you're pulling things versus Corellia, you're getting the same data over the time period from the same mouse, basically. So in that sense, you're using way less mouse uh, kind of like simplifies the essay and increases the data quality and also reduces the cost. Uh, in terms of like uh, data, this is the data we reported to the customer in this project. Uh, we, ge we generated standard uh, uh, curve, which uh, spans five log dynamic range with industrial standard sensitivity uh, with excellent R square values, of course, and, and using just one microliter of raw sample. Uh, to generate three data points in this case. And this was a therapeutic human monoclonal antibody uh, uh, tested in, in the mouse serum. 
In example application two, I'll be talking about tumor profiling and a case uh, from uh, precision medi medicine application uh, where, uh, where the end user uh, profiling primary tumor cells uh, from immuno-oncology clinical trial patients. So these are like uh, real uh, cells coming from real patients and grown in petri dish and probed against different therapies to see how they are like working. So in that sense, the problem is that this patient's uh, primary tumor cells are difficult to culture in petri dish. And once you kind of successfully culture them, like those, like first of all, biopsies yield like small amount of material. Plus after you culture, that, that material you're getting from spermatins natins are like highly precision material. So in this project, for example, our collaborator, our customers sent us just 10 microliters of sample per study and asked us to generate data. I've used just like 2.5 microliters of that volume to generate triptych data points. So like it is like a two micro, the solution that we are offering is like two microliter cytokine assays for screening uh, primary tumor cell uh, spermatins against therapeutic uh, proteins. Uh, data looks pretty good. Uh, we sent them comparison data compared to like uh, industry gold standards. In this case, for example, commercialized uh, LISA having two lows of dynamic range and 6.5 picograms per milliliter limit of detection requiring 100 microliters and taking hours a day to complete versus RSA giving five low dynamic range, 0.6 picograms per milliliter an order of magnitude lower sensitivity and 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 50 times less sample volume uh, requirement after dilution. So uh, this in this graph, we are comparing our curve, standard curve, to another commercially available LISA platform in this case. You can see that like what that, that wide dynamic range means to the customer. So if the customer is starting an assay using the competitor system where the, the concentration of the target falls outside that detection zone, they will need to repeat that assay. So in our case, that's not the case. Five log is like really generous. So the target will fall within that fine dynamic range. And not only they will be saving another experiment, the experiment they are running will just use two microliters of sample, it will have multiplex capacity and run a lot, a lot faster. Uh, overall, uh, this slide, uh, I wanted to just discuss overall repeatability and assay accuracy. So on the left, you're seeing seeing like six standard curves coming from six batches of manufacturing, uh, where the standard curves are kind of like uh, are kind of like uh, almost perfectly overlaying each other, uh, showing their excellent batch to batch repeatability. Uh, in terms of getting the more specific cases, uh, inter assay repeatability, we are getting around uh, less than 10% CVs. In this case, this is like human IL-1 beta target. And for intra assay repeatability within the same assay, uh, we are seeing down to 5% uh, assays. And, and good news is like uh, with every project, every um, uh, experiment we are doing, we are seeing an increase in our CVs. So in the next six months, we are uh, hoping to report CVs below 5%. So in short, innovative core technology merged with automation, pushed limits across multiple dimensions by orders of magnitude and gives freedom to customers to operate uh, the SA, have control the RSA in the way they, they want. So they have kind of like, a, they have a, a sample volume limitation. We get a check mark. They need a fast to say, they get the chart mark. Uh, they need a, a long, right, large detection range, a dynamic range, they get what they want. They need a multiplex assay to test multiple mark, by marks at the same time and check marks. So in that sense, uh, uh, we are getting a lot of interest and we are hoping that actually this technology will be serving a lot more uh, people generating relevant data and move faster uh, with the results and get their therapies to those patients in a more timely manner and also reduce the cost. That's our motivation. So ongoing and future application areas include human blood serum biomarkers, uh, multiplex diagnostics and rapid point of care tests. So uh, due to the time limit, I didn't discuss here, but a couple of years ago, we completed a project with NIH. And, uh, and in that project, we delivered actually a nine volt battery operated uh, handheld instrument, which uh, fully runs the assays that we are talking about here 
in a point of care fashion, in a miniaturized fashion, in a fully automated way in less than 15, 15 minutes. So if you are interested, if you have interest in these areas, feel free to get in touch to get more information or see uh, how we can help uh, solving or addressing your, your essay and needs or unmet needs. So this is a definitely changing field. Uh, I will say next five years, the next 10 years will be more interesting than today. Uh, so in this regard, we are definitely interested for hearing from you. Uh, your questions, comments, suggestions, reach us at uh, info at coreliabio.com. And if you want to specifically reach me, just use lab roots Kirshad in the keyword, and uh, that will make sure that actually I'll be seeing that email as well. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Um, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you.